from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, and the Eyes Editorial Director. Today, we're going to be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on economic migration, with a focus on migration trends in the Western Black Sea and South Caucasus. There are nearly 300 million economic migrants outside their home countries today, and they have an outsized impact on the global economy. Even though they account for just 3.5% of the population, they contribute around 10% of total GDP. The largest flow of economic migrants worldwide is from countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia to other countries in that same region. To help us make sense of how the pandemic is affecting economic migrants and migration trends, we're joined today by two great guests, Yulia Joja and Bob Hamilton. Yulia is a senior fellow with MEI's Frontier Europe Initiative, a DAAD postdoctoral fellow at the Johns Hopkins SICE Foreign Policy Institute, and an adjunct professor at Georgetown. Bob is an associate professor of Eurasian Studies at the U.S. Army War College and a Black Sea Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Yulia, Bob, thank you both for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, Alistair. Glad to be here and hi to everybody. Before we get started, for those of you interested in migration, I should also note that MEI's Frontier Europe Initiative will be hosting a webinar on May 7th on migration in Turkey and Eastern Europe in association with Poland's OSW Center for Eastern Studies. For more information about that, please consult our website. Yulia, COVID-19 has forced many working migrants to return to their home countries. In the Western Black Sea region, where are the migrants coming from and returning to, and just how many people are involved? So the migrants in Romania and in Bulgaria are coming mostly um, right now with the COVID crisis from the West. There are about 3 million Romanians living abroad, mostly in um, the European Union, and about 2 million Bulgarians. And you can imagine um, how much pressure this has created um, for the government in Romania and Bulgaria um, at the uh, at the outbreak of the crisis, because um, many of the Romanians and Bulgarians are working um, in the Western European countries that have been hit the fastest and uh, and also the hardest, like um, Italy and Spain, um, UK, Germany and France. That's where most of them have been working. And um, many of them have tried to return. Many of them also infected, so have brought um, the infection back home. We have about um, 300,000 Romanians who have successfully re-entered Romania over the last um, two months and about 200,000 Bulgarians. And that's actually a lot compared to a population of um, 20 million um, in Romania and uh, um, 7 million in Bulgaria. And it has also meant um, that the governments have been um, challenged in imposing the lockdown and in um, on the other side, letting Romanians and Bulgarians return to their home. And um, if you compare, if we are to compare Romania and Bulgaria, though Romania is about um, three times um, larger than um, than Bulgaria in rough terms, the number of COVID cases has been very different in that Romania has had 10 times more, um, both infections, about 12,000, um, over 12,000 um, infections and 700 um, deaths um, compared to Bulgaria that has only had 1,500 infections and under 70 deaths. Um, so this has been the, the major trend in terms of migration and the challenges that have come with it uh, for uh, in the context of um, COVID-19, that hundreds of thousands of Romanians and Bulgarians have tried to and, and su succeeded in the end in coming back but have put uh, major pressure pr pressure on the public health system um, in these two countries and also on, um, on how the governments have been um, dealing with the lockdown impositions. Bob, what about in the South Caucasus? What trends are we seeing there? So in the South Caucasus, it's hard to get exact numbers for the number of uh, economic migrants who have returned. But as you noted in the uh, introduction, the largest number, is the McKinsey report of 2016, noted that the largest number uh, of economic migrants in the world are 20, the 22.9 million, or almost 23 million then, who move from the countries of Europe and Central Asia to other countries in that region. So, And the trend has normally been from less developed to more developed economies, of course. So many of these people from the South Caucasus, from Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan are working likely certainly in Russia. And then for Georgians specifically, 
there's a lot of indications of Georgians uh, trying to return from EU countries, uh, Poland, Greece, Italy, and others. And so um, while the exact numbers we don't really know, uh, you can you can assume that there is a large large number of people trying to return uh, from abroad to those countries. For Georgia, like I said, many are returning from EU countries. The Georgian government has organized uh, flights, just like uh, many governments have. At least 5,000 Georgians uh, have been repatriated uh, since the outbreak began. Uh, many others who would like to come home can't because they've lost their jobs and they can't afford uh, the commercial airline tickets uh, to get home to the extent that there are even commercial airline flights available in Georgia, at least. Uh, only Georgian Airways is is flying in, and all those flights have to be cleared with uh, the government. And I believe it's the same in Armenia and Azerbaijan. The outbreaks in these three countries, of course, they're much smaller than Romania and Bulgaria. Georgia's population is about 4 million. Armenia is, is just under 3 million, and Azerbaijan is just under 10 million. Uh, the numbers are still fairly small, and the, all three governments reacted early to the crisis, uh, to the pandemic, and have done a fairly good job of mitigating its effects. The, the latest numbers, these come from Johns Hopkins, uh, as of yesterday, were just over 1,900 cases in Armenia, Armenia with 30 deaths, uh, just over 1,700 cases in Azerbaijan with 23 deaths, and 517 cases with six deaths in Georgia. Uh, Georgia's gotten a, a lot of specifically been singled out by a, a lot of the public health organizations and and its international partners uh, for an early and effective response to the crisis. Yulia, as migrants from the Western Black Sea have been forced home, what economic impact has that had on the countries they've left, on the ones they've returned to, and on the region more broadly? So the economic impact is still unclear in terms of um, how big it will be for um, countries on the western um, side of the Black Sea. Um, what we know so far is that um, it's probably going to be very, very big in in the sense that um, we have, in, in the case of Romania, the biggest country in the region, about um, 3 million people outside, as I mentioned earlier, um, working abroad, uh, mostly in, in the Western Union. That means that the um, Romanian economy is highly dependent on foreign remittances. And um, when it comes to, um, to Bulgaria, it's a similar case with a huge number of um, Bulgarians living abroad and so um, sending their money home. And in the case of Romania, for instance, um, the situation is far worse in the sense that we have in Romania over one million people um, living um, and working in the government sector and being paid out, out of the um, government uh, budget and five million retired people also living out of the state budget. And that means that we are left with 4.5 million people in the private sector in Romania and over 2 million people who are working abroad, which just shows how big the demographic um, impact is in, in economic terms. Um, and with the economic crisis right now, obviously many um, huge companies that are uh, focused on exports and that the Romanian economy depends on have closed. The largest um, exporter um, in Romania is the um, automotive um, company Dacia, um, which um, has had sales drop over the last month um, to about 40%. Um, these numbers just show how big um, the economic um, impact will be in the next few months. The rating of um, Romania and, and uh, Bulgaria will possibly be downgraded. Um, and, and that means also that um, they will have to pay uh, higher prices for loans, obviously, and um, they will have a far more unstable economy in the next few months. But in overall terms, um, in terms of economic crisis, we don't know exactly yet. We just don't have enough data to know how big the impact will be um, for the next um, year in, in Romania and Bulgaria. Bob, do you have a sense of the impact of the coronavirus crisis and the return of economic migrants on the economies in the South Caucasus? Yeah, I sure do. Uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia are all going to be hit uh, very hard uh, by the, the return of uh, the economic migrants and by just the general effects of the, the COVID-19 crisis. So in ascending order of how bad it's going to be, Armenia will probably fare best. It was, it was 
had the highest economic growth in 2019 among the three countries. It and Georgia are both very dependent upon remittances. They're among about the top 20 countries in the world in terms of dependence on remittances. Georgia's uh, remittances in Georgia make up over 14% of total GDP. And in Armenia, they make up over 11% of GDP. So both of these countries are gonna be hit hard. Armenia will probably fare a little better for two reasons. One, like I said, it had higher economic growth uh, in the year prior to the COVID-19 crisis. And then number two, Georgia is also very dependent on tourism. Uh, its economy is very dependent on, on international arrivals. They almost doubled in Georgia from 4.7 million in 2012 to over 9 million in 2019. And tourism cont contributed over $3 billion to the Georgian economy. That's almost 8% of GDP. The indirect share is 35% of GDP, which is the highest in Europe. And um, and the former Soviet Union. So both of these countries are probably gonna see large currency devaluations. Uh, in Georgia, the, the poverty rate, which had been falling steadily before this, the advent of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, will probably tick up again uh, because of the crisis. Uh, and then for Azerbaijan, it's actually gonna probably be hit the hardest. Although it's not as dependent upon remittances as Armenia and Georgia, it's very dependent upon hy hydrocarbons, oil and gas because of the collapse in oil prices caused partially by the COVID-19 uh, crisis and, the, and the, just the general lack of economic activity and also by the recent Saudi-Russian uh, oil price war, uh, Azerbaijan is expected to fare the worst of the three uh, in the COVID-19 crisis, but not due to the reduced impact of remittances, but just due to the oil, oil price crash. So the, the World Bank projections right now for 2020 GDP growth for the three are that Armenia will grow slightly, about 1.7%. Georgia will be flat. The economy will essentially grow at 0%. And Azerbaijan will suffer a small contraction of about 0.2%. Yulia, how are governments in the Western Black Sea dealing with the issue of returning migrants? What sort of financial support or assistance are they providing? Well, the, the governments in on the western side of the Black Sea have been, as mentioned before, hugely challenged um, in, in terms of coping um, with, with the crisis. Um, first, um, both Bulgaria and Romania and then Moldova, um, to an even worse extent, have been suffering a crisis because of the public health um, systems that are um, largely underdeveloped and insufficient. Um, so they've had to appeal... Um, to aid uh, from the European Union, from the World Bank um, for economic recovery, and also to other governments in terms of medical equipment and uh, medical aid and also um, resources in terms of personnel. And this has uh, had a slow effect uh, within these countries and that the EU has been very slow to respond, but also that the governments um, have had huge challenges in organizing a response that would um, diminish the effects. But we also have um, from these countries some, some lessons learned and uh, some good models of how they can cope with um, with the challenges given with their um, frail and, and unstable um, economic situation. So, for instance, in Romania, an, an interesting story occurred in that um, uh, Romanians, Bulgarians across the regions have had trouble um, implementing, the governments have had trouble implementing the lockdown. People were not respecting um, the lockdown as much as they should. So Romania pushed for um, very huge um, fines um, that were basically unaffordable for people, um, which um, has also meant that um, the government through the police force and the armed forces, both um, police and armed forces have been um, mobilized in, in both countries, Romania and Bulgaria, have been able to um, put together a huge fund based on fines um, from the population who wasn't respecting um, uh, the lockdown that goes then into uh, medical aid and, uh, and coping government's uh, uh, funding for coping um, with the crisis. And um, they've also been, these countries, able to secure some uh, medical equipment from um, allies and, and other countries. Recently, we've had news that um, the United States is sending uh, some uh, equipment to, to Romania. Romania was able to um, secure 2 million masks from South Korea, um, and that has helped a lot 
But there's also been trouble um, in that, for instance, in Bulgaria, initially the government has um, adopted an anti-EU rhetoric because the, the go governments um, from that region were slow in receiving EU aid and EU funding and EU was slow to move. Um, that has shifted over the last few um, weeks um, into um, um, non-populist rhetoric. But uh, but initially, it was definitely a challenge also for the population to understand um, where um, aid is available and how much um, the West is doing um, to aid um, these countries. And last and not but not least, um, Romania has also had a, a good example very recently of showing regional support um, to Moldova, which is a non-EU country and even poorer. Um, they've sent, the Romanian government has managed, um, despite the challenges, to um, send um, medical staff, um, nurses and doctors from Romania to Moldova to aid in a country where in Moldova, there's about 1 million um, people with double citizenship, Romanian and Moldovan. So there's been some encouraging stories um, here and there, but we can still see from the numbers, as, as Bob also mentioned earlier, um, there's still huge challenges uh, for the government to cope with the crisis now in immediate terms um, for in terms of public health and um, uh, immediate economic aid. But it will be um, a huge challenge for the government also in the months to come uh, in terms of economic recovery and uh, easing the lockdown measures gradually. Bob, how are governments in the South Caucasus responding to the return of migrants? Are they providing support or aid? And are there any noteworthy success stories or failures in that regard? Unfortunately, all three countries, but especially Georgia, have extensive experience with assisting internally displaced people or refugees due to the, the wars they experienced in the 1990s. And then for Georgia, the more recent 2008 war with Russia. So they all have experience with this. Uh, in Georgia, which is the case I know the best, there is an extensive IDP uh, housing program. So there's, there's housing for the IDPs from the wars in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, Azerbaijan, though, was singled out recently by the International Organization on Migration as the first post-Soviet country to be elevated to the steering group of the Global Forum on Migration and Development, which the UN says makes it well-placed to help its migrants, the people returning, its economic migrants returning due to the COVID-19 crisis. I mentioned earlier the Georgian government has organized flights to bring over 5,000 Georgians home, but there are thousands more that are out of work and stranded abroad, can't afford tickets home. Some of them, uh, many people from this region work as caretakers for elderly people in more developed countries. So some of them uh, can't, can't leave their elderly clients, even though they would prefer to return home. Uh, the Georgian government assistant, assistance package, and again, Georgia is the case I know the best, um, they've unveiled a, 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 a row or a raft of assistance measures to the population for people affected by COVID-19. Uh, the government is covering electricity, water, and waste management bills uh, for 1.2 million families for three months, and then gas bills for 670,000 families for three months. And given that Georgia's only, a, only has a population of about 4 million, that's a significant percentage of the population. The government's also worked with food importers to make sure that what they, the nine foods that they designate as staple foods uh, are insulated against gouging or price spikes. They've deferred loan payments for people. They've uh, extended unemployment assistance at six, uh, for six months uh, at a fairly small rate of 200 Georgian lari a month. Um, they have state subsidies and tax breaks to, to employers for retaining people in jobs, in other words, for not laying people off. Uh, and they've targeted assistance at the most socially and economically vulnerable parts of the population using what they call a social rating score. Uh, so both Armenia and Georgia took very early action to respond to the crisis from a public health stan uh, stance. And they've both received very good marks from their international partners and from international organizations, the WHO and others. Uh, for their handling of the crisis. Armenia declared a state of emergency in, in mid-March on the 16th. It's been extended until May 14th. Uh, it's the standard raft of measures, closing of schools and universities, prohibition on large public gatherings, restrictions on movement, screening and quarantine measures, and restriction on entry, so closed borders and limited flights. Uh, Georgia's state of emergency was declared on the 21st of March and has been extended until the 22nd of May. Uh, it also has some municipalities under quarantine, so people are restricted from moving in and out of those. Uh, other than that, it's 
its its measures are very similar to Armenia's, with the exception that Georgia has a nationwide curfew in effect from 9 p.m. Uh, until 6 a.m. every day. Uh, recently, the UN Development Program issued a statement uh, describing Georgia's healthcare sector as very well prepared for the pandemic, but noting the Georgian economy was very vulnerable to it. So I think that's what you're going to see in all of these countries is that their public health sectors, uh, given the fact that they're still developing countries, for developing countries, their public health sectors are fairly well prepared to deal with it. The fact that the governments acted early has meant that they have not seen the spike in cases uh, and the strain on the public health system that you've seen in some other countries. Uh, but their economies, as I noted earlier, are all three very vulnerable uh, to the effects of the pandemic. Uh, one thing I should note that people, some analysts and observers uh, have, have expressed some concern about is the fact that Azerbaijan, which is very much the most authoritarian of these three countries, is maybe using the COVID-19 response as a way to crack down on dissidents. There have been a number of arrests of people in Azerbaijan. Uh, for alleged violations of the the social distancing and public safety measures, uh, but they tend to be dissidents and opposition activists. So uh, that's something that probably bears watching. You know, since you asked about Georgia, it's uh, about all three, but talking about Georgia, it's it's probably worth uh, talking a little bit about what's happening in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, right? The two Georgian territories that are under Russian military occupation since 2008. Um, they essentially have responded in the same way that uh, the, the countries of the South Caucasus have. Abkhazia closed their border with Georgia early on March 11th, but then on the 22nd of March, they still held a presidential election, which was you know, a fairly risky event in the early days of a pandemic. Uh, they extended a state of emergency on 27 March, and the restrictions are similar to those in, in the rest of Georgia. Local public transport and taxis, though, uh, will be allowed to operate again on May 1st, but the rest of the things will remain in place. So schools and non-life-sustaining businesses will remain closed. Large public events will still be banned, and that, that will be at least until May 15th. Uh, their economic relief measures are similar to those in Georgia, in the rest of Georgia, but on a much smaller scale. They've done some limited tax relief and some debt restructuring. Uh, they've gotten limited aid from the World Health Organization in Russia, but most observers of Abkhazia conclude that their public health system would be unable to handle an outbreak of any significance. They're lucky in the sense that currently uh, there are only three cases reported in Abkhazia, one of which was fatal. In the other Georgian breakaway region of South Ossetia, uh, they closed their boundary line with Georgia on the 27th of February, immediately after Georgia declared its first case of COVID-19. Uh, they had a March 26 government decree that essentially did the same thing as the decrees in the rest of Georgia and Abkhazia did. South Ossetia is almost completely dependent upon uh, aid from, from the Russian Federation for its state budget. So it's got a very limited ability to offset the economic hardship that it, people may be feeling. Uh, the only thing they've really been able to do is rent relief for people out of work, and, and they've instituted some measures against price, price gouging. Their health sector is really completely unprepared for an outbreak of any significance, probably even less prepared than Abkhazia. So in the case of any significant outbreak in Abkhazia or South Ossetia, they would be forced to rely on either Georgia or Russia, uh, the health systems in, in Georgia or Russia, to help them handle it. In a way, the lack of an outbreak in Abkhazia and South Ossetia just shows how isolated they are from the rest of the world. Ilya, you mentioned earlier that the EU has been slow to respond to the crisis, but I wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit more. What is Brussels doing to help Bulgaria and Romania deal with COVID-19 and the, the kind of resulting economic crisis? Luckily, they finally have done a lot. So in the first few weeks, um, they uh, didn't, frankly, manage to get their act together. And uh, as uh, as it was, uh, we were focusing um, with the media on the outbreak in Italy, um, Italy and other member states um, that have been hard hit from the beginning have struggled to get medical equipment um, from their um, fellow EU members, and there were accusations within um, the European Commission of um, nationalism of EU member states in, in not providing aid and not um, responding in solidarity. Um, in the end, um, in terms of finance and um, economic recovery, economic aid from the European Union for its member states, um, it has been um, finalized a few weeks ago. Um, so the, the news are actually pretty good. Um, for instance, for Romania, um, there will be 1.5 uh, billion um, euros available 
um, from the European Union. Um, it's in phases that the money becomes available and, uh, and, and it's still um, slow in, in getting actually to the governments. Nevertheless, it's, it's significant funds that will um, definitely help um, countries like Romania and Bulgaria um, over the crisis. Uh, in Bulgaria, similarly, um, the government uh, will receive 800 million euros, and that's proportional to, to um, the needs of, of each country. Um, however, some of these funds are actually funds that Romania and Bulgaria have not been able um, to spend um, in, in EU structural funding terms, for instance, almost um, 450 million um, euros out of the 1.5 billion for Romania have been actually funds that Romania was supposed to return, um, have not having been able to, to spend them on other things and, and will now stay with Romania. So it's real money, but it's uh, complicated to get it. And, uh, and, and in terms of the um, EU long term, the challenge will be for Romania and Bulgaria specifically, whether the people who are working abroad in, in Western European, more developed countries will be able to go back mostly um, to their jobs, will not be able, will not lose their jobs because foreign remittances are a high dependency um, for Romania and Bulgaria. And this will be basically the, the main challenge that the governments will have to deal with in terms of the relationship, the Romanian and the Bulgarian government, in terms of the relationship with EU um, member states and um, EU institutions. Bob, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia are all EU Eastern Partnership countries. What sort of assistance is the EU offering them? Right. So the EU has offered assistance, financial assistance to all three uh, to varying degrees. Azerbaijan has received the least, probably because economically, uh, it, it's in the best shape. So Armenia had the highest growth, but in terms of uh, per capita GDP, Azerbaijan is in the best shape of the three. Uh, to, to date, EU funds to Azerbaijan have been about 14 million euro, uh, focused on immediate and short-term needs. In, in, for instance, the purchase of personal protective uh, garments for medical staff. Uh, Armenia has received over 92 million euros in support. That's been focused largely on Poverty, poverty alleviation and things like that. The most vulnerable households have received humanitarian aid packages. Uh, Georgia's received the most assistance uh, at 183 million euros, uh, so significantly more, almost double what Armenia received and well over 10 times what Azerbaijan received. That assistance has been focused on protection of vulnerable people, uh, the importation or, or, or manufacture locally of personal protective equipment, uh, for instance, EU funds were used to purchase sewing machines. So a Georgian uh, factory was able to make 40,000 medical gowns, right, to help the country respond to the outbreak. So the EU has provided pretty significant economic assistance to these three Eastern Partnership countries, uh, but to varying degrees based on the need of the country. Yulia, are there any other migration trends in the Western Black Sea region that are worth noting? There is one that is um, that comes pre-COVID um, crisis and will probably um, be reignited uh, once uh, the governments ease lockdown and the borders will be reopened. And that is um, Syrian, mostly Syrian refugees in Turkey trying to get west. Um, now, as we know, um, just before um, the major outbreak in Europe, there were um, hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees at the at the um, border with uh, Greece um, trying to get into the European Union. And um, the Turkish media at that point was showing, in, including alternative maps and paths to, um, um, to, uh, to the population um, that they can take, um, refugees and migrants could take through Bulgaria and Romania. And that has caused panic um, for Romania and Bulgaria in the sense that um, these two countries are, are known as transit countries, not as a destination countries for migrants. And they've had um, they've constituted a, a smaller migration path in the context of 2015, the um, European migration crisis, and after that in the next few years. And they've tried um, to cut down on migration in, in different ways. Bulgaria has finalized uh, uh, a border um, fence, uh, a wire fence um, with at the border um, 
um, to Turkey in 2017, trying to um, limit uh, migration and has um, has been known to use the method of detention centers in Bulgaria to limit migration um, towards the West. And both these countries um, are EU members, but are not Schengen. So that makes them more of transit countries. And these trends have obviously um, stopped um, with COVID, but given um, the the big problem that um, refugees constitute for the European Union and have constituted over the last five years, um, it's very likely that um, post-COVID crisis, these paths um, will be um, revisited and um, issues um, can be reignited in that um, Romania and Bulgaria um, also have a track record, unfortunately, of illegal trafficking, um, of, of transit countries with um, problems in terms of how um, migrants and refugees are being treated and how um, authorities in, in um, the two countries with very different backgrounds and different methods have been um, um, trying to solve this problem. So this is um, a smaller migration trend in terms of uh, numbers uh, compared to the hundreds of thousands that are returning or have returned um, from the West to Romania and Bulgaria. But it's nevertheless um, a relevant um, transit path and migration path that will probably um, re-become a focus for the media after the COVID crisis. Bob, an added complication for the countries of the South Caucasus is their location just next door to Iran, which was one of the early epicenters of the pandemic. How did governments in the region respond to that, and what's the status of their connections with Iran now? Yeah, as you noted, Alistair, Iran was one of the hardest hit countries early on in the pandemic, and it was actually the source of both of the first infections in both Georgia and Armenia. So Armenia and Azerbaijan, which share borders with Iran, shut their borders in March. Uh, Azerbaijan recently announced its border would remain closed until at least the 4th of May. Armenia's is also still closed, uh, although I don't think the Armenian government has yet uh, announced when it might reopen. Uh, Although Georgia doesn't have a border with Iran, um, Iran is among, in the last several years, is, is among the top six or eight sources of tourist arrivals in Georgia with over 300,000 a year uh, in the last few years. So the potential for widespread infection early in the pandemic was significant. I, admittedly, as I was watching Georgia and watching their numbers early on, I kept expecting the numbers to spike just because uh, I had assumed with all the Iranian tourists in Georgia before the flights were shut down that there would have been more infections than there were. But uh, I think Georgia acted early, and it probably just got a little lucky in that uh, it didn't suffer uh, a huge spike in infections due to people, tourists coming in from Iran. We're running short on time, but before we wrap up, I'd like to get both of your thoughts about where you see things heading going forward, as I suspect we're going to be dealing with the consequences of all this for quite a long time to come. Yulia, what sort of long-term plans do governments in the Western Black Sea have for dealing with this? I think governments in the Western Black Sea region will be focused on um, easing lockdown slowly um, without having to go into lockdown again, um, similarly to Western European countries, but also focusing um, uh, similarly to Western European countries on economic re- um, recovery, with the difference that they um, will be more challenged by um, the economic um a situation by how unstable they are and by how um, they deal with the state budget and uh, the challenges to come in terms of social policy, uh, what I mentioned earlier in terms of um, um, new laws for um, raising pensions um, in Romania that are due to be implemented this autumn and that probably will not be able to be Uh, sustained by the government by um, elections. It's an election year in Romania, particularly with um, two major elections coming up. So um, the economic crisis and COVID are um, right now um, in the Western Black Sea region are becoming highly politicized. And uh, Governments, um, like everywhere, will be held responsible in how they have reacted, and this will be, um, and the outcome will be clear um, in the elections. So the pressure is high for them to secure um, stable um, economic recovery funding externally, and um, this is what I believe they will be focused on in the next uh, few months. Bob, how do you see the situation developing in the South Caucasus? 
I think, uh, as Yulia said, Romania and Bulgaria will do. I think all three countries will slowly and incrementally and probably cautiously ease the lockdown or social distancing measures that they've put in effect. Uh, Georgia actually had a prohibition on, on driving uh, personal vehicles or riding in taxis over the Orthodox Easter holiday, uh, which then expired after Orthodox Easter. Um, so they'll all three slowly and incrementally uh, lift some of the restrictions. Uh, all three are also going to require fiscal stimulus. The problem is that none of them have as easy access to global financial markets as, say, EU countries or the, or the United States do. Uh, uh, so they can't finance their stimulus uh, through debt at as low an interest rate as, for instance, we can. The United States, for a while, was borrowing uh, long term at, at, at rates close to zero. So these three countries won't have won't have the advantage of that, but they're still going to require fiscal stimulus. After they've dealt with the immediate economic effects of the COVID-19 crisis, they're going to have to stimulate the economies to return to growth over the long term. Uh, the advantage they have is they all are receiving assistance from uh, the EU, from the U from the US, and from international organizations like the World Bank. Uh, just as an example, Georgian government estimates the cost of its immediate economic plan to address the pandemic at three and a half billion Georgian lari, which is about uh, 1.1 billion dollars, but it's received three billion in aid. Now, uh, Georgia's overall needs are, are going to be much more than the 1.1 billion it's already spent, right? So, those address the immediate impact, but then it's going to have longer-term economic impact and also public health uh, impacts that it's going to have to address. But while it doesn't have access to financial markets in the same way that EU countries or the U.S. does, it is a recipient of foreign aid that will help offset some of the cost uh, of the required fiscal stimulus. That's all we have time for today. But Yulia Bob, thank you both for joining the program. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. My pleasure. And thank you as well to our listeners for tuning in and to our production team for their work on today's episode. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.